Good morning. Uh, I'm talking this morning about living waters, but I'm actually going to start today with a scriptural reading, which is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. And it's from the New International Version. It's a letter written by Jesus to the church in Laodicea. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were, either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, because you're neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, I don't need a thing. But you don't realise that you're wretched and poor, pitiful, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and self to put on your eyes so that you can see. Those who I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at your door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and I sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Now, I can't help thinking that the people that went before us, our great-grandparents and so on, would have only had a very shallow level of understanding of this because they lacked what we now take for granted in archaeology and history. It's available to us now, and it wasn't available to them previously. So they could only have skimmed the surface of the meaning of the letter, because like now, we know so much more from archaeological digs that have been unearthed and, and the stuff that's been reassembled. So the visual images available to us give us, give us different layers of understanding of the written word on the page. For example, Laodicea, to who that letter was addressed, it was equally distant from two other towns of Hierapolis and Colossae, four miles each way, it was in a valley, below and between them. Now Hierapolis still today is like a, a spa resort because it's got the therapeutic hot water springs and pools, um, just as it did then. Um, and Colossi, on the other hand, had snow melt run off from the, from the mountain, so it was cold, fresh water. So both these places are four miles away. Now, although Laodicea was built on the River Lycus, the River Lycus, even today, the water is foul. You c can't really drink it, you can't cook with it. It's going to make your clothes smell if you wash them in that water. But it was on an important trade route, and that's why they were so wealthy. So they sourced their water, and you can see the pipes now, you can see them if you just do a quick Google. Pipes that look almost as modern as we would use now. And they had these massive pipelines from Colossae and Hierapolis. Um, they piped their water in, they had pumping systems, and you name it, it was all quite state-of-the-art. The trouble was, because of the climate there, that by the time the water arrived from either of those with them, it was lukewarm. And hence, we can understand Jesus' reference in saying to them, you're neither hot nor cold, because the same was true of the water that they piped in. It was a business capital. It's in, it's in Turkey now, incidentally. Uh, <clears throat> it was a business capital with a huge wool and textile industry. They had their own center for banking and commerce. They had their own currency, even. So when Jesus is saying to buy in the refined gold from him, direct reference to their banking, because they say they're rich, and he's saying, no, you're not, you're poor. This is a letter to a community who are a faith-based community. They are Christian but they kind of drifted a bit. And Jesus is saying, look, because I love you, I'm rebuking you. Um, and that's why with the eye cells that they made from the salts and the minerals that came in the water, they made world-class eye ointments uh, for in their own medical school. This was the level that they had reached. But because of their conceit in these matters, with their banking and their currency, it's their pride that's made them poor. They've got great financial wealth, but they need to buy refined gold or humility from God himself if they want to be truly rich. They make their own eye ointments, but they're told that they're blind because of their pride, and to buy eye salve from God if they want to see. They've got their own textiles and woolen industries, but their pride makes them naked before God. And again, Jesus, through 
the Apostle John is telling them to humble themselves before God to obtain the white garments of forgiveness because God will see the broken heart of humility which is needed for forgiveness. It was their conceit and their pride in what they did, their pride in their own abilities, that Jesus is putting the spotlight onto when he's telling them that everything they do is as nothing if they don't do it with God and his son Jesus being central in their lives. Not long after John had written Revelation, a terrible earthquake in this area devastated the place. It smashed it to pieces. Um, and they're huge markets that you can visit now. They've been rebuilt now this century. You can visit as a tourist. All of that got trashed. And so because Rome was the occupying power, we now know from the Roman historians that Rome had said, would you like some financial assistance to rebuild? And it's recorded that their pride led them to say, no thanks, we're fine, we can do it ourselves. And they said no to money from Rome. Uh, the pride was again showing its ugly head because they had all of the outward signs but none of the inner signs of godliness. And so they draw down on themselves this stern rebuke. Now, not, compared to other letters in Revelation to other churches, Laodicea is not being accused of drifting from the faith into worshipping false gods or of giving too much ground to the emperor. They're accused of being boring. They're accused of being lukewarm. Because in the summer, a cool drink is nice and refreshing. And in the winter, maybe a hot cup of cocoa in the morning or a coffee brings comfort. But all year round, a lukewarm drink is just mediocre. and Nobody really wants a lukewarm drink. They were accused by Jesus of not wanting the assistance that God has for them. He says they consider they're rich and they've got no need of anything, that basically they pushed God out to the margins of their life. And he says, but your pride has made you wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. Direct references to all of the sources of their physical financial wealth. We, we so often read now, uh, during lockdown, of how... Uh, alcohol abuse has risen dramatically. Online access to pornography has increased massively. Domestic violence has increased massively. We hear on the radio of people buying all sorts of crazy things they don't even need or want. They buy it online just so they're having contact outside of their homes and their communities. Uh, I heard a radio presenter the other day, a lady said she's got a freezer full of these exotic, unusual steaks that she'd bought and they're going to last her for years. Well, I've got to make a bit of a confession myself because I accidentally purchased a pack of water purification tablets and I've got no earthly idea why I bought them or, or what I had in mind to use them for. Maybe in a previous life I might have, but now definitely not. And then we've got other outward signs now of comfort eating, of substance abuse, of hoarding, selfish panic buying, emotional sins such as anger and jealousy and hatred. It seems like the world is so angry at the moment. And the list is endless of how we're living incorrectly. We're putting obstacles in the path of experiencing the love of the Saviour, of drawing the full measure of love he has for us. It's time that we hit our reset button. Working in the lab, I use sensitive measuring instruments. We depend on the readings that they give. Uh, and so that they will continue to give proper readings, they have to have regular calibration checks in order that they can be trusted. And in our lives, we have to hit the reset. Every time when we take a moment to pray or by putting time aside to read and study scripture, we're pressing the reset button, we're recalibrating, we're keeping our eye on the ball. Maybe we're like an ember that's fallen out of the fire and we're still glowing but the heat has gone out because it's alone by itself and it's not up close to the others that are like it. And right now that could be true of us in a time that we don't have communal in-person worship. So it's time to renew the commitment, get back in the fire. There are still online services on Zoom, on Facebook, on YouTube. There are WhatsApp prayer groups. We have Christian friends and brothers and sisters on the end of a phone or an email or a text or messenger or Facebook that we can share with to keep our fires alive. We're not meant to do it alone. And we are alone when we cut Christ out of our life. Maybe we think we're doing enough or we don't want to give something up in order to do what the Holy Spirit's still small voice is telling us. Sometimes it might be that we're unwilling to fully commit to Christ and his will. We know that something in our lives that we're allowing is actually wrong. And that still small voice is just giving us a little nudge. But shouldn't we 
prepare ourselves to listen and project the heat of our faith to our brothers and sisters. Because if not, we're lukewarm. The whole of all 66 books of the Bible are all components of one continuous story of God reaching out to his people, to us. And from the story of Genesis, that silver thread runs all the way through to Revelation. It's a stream of living water welling up to eternal life. A gospel of available forgiveness and love. Now, I was reading this morning. Bear with me, I'm not going home, I'm still here. I was reading this morning before coming here. I was reading Tom Wright's book, Broken Signposts, and I thought it was appropriate to put in a short paragraph at this point in this sermon. The signpost, the broken signpost at this point, is natural beauty in the world around us. And he says this, this is Tom Wright, Perhaps part of the role of beauty is actually to help us to find grace within grief. Perhaps. And yet into this brokenness comes a God who seems to care deeply about beauty. A God who, according to the Bible, created the heavens and the earth to tell of his glory. Not because he needs us to admire that glory, but because the glory is a true outflowing of his own generous love. And what's more, this God dares to whisper to us, even in the midst of our fractured world, that we are created in his own image, and that this God-reflecting vocation can be and is being restored. And he says this is, in fact, a major theme of the New Testament. So I just wanted to include that at that point. So to continue, maybe you're agreeing with what I'm saying, You agree with the knowledge and the sentiments, perhaps, but maybe for you, life's got in the way. Or you think your foibles have gone on for too long. Maybe you think you can't any longer put up the fight against temptation, uh, climbing your way out of the pit. Maybe you feel too much water's gone under the bridge, or you're battle-weary. And if that describes you, why not make today a day that you renew your commitments? Decide you don't want to be lukewarm and come back to God, because he's waiting with his arms wide open to embrace you in his tender care. And as, it, like the parable of the prodigal son, he wants to welcome you home. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well in John 4, and I'm paraphrasing here, he says, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for a drink, and I would give you living water, and you'll never be thirsty again, and it will become in you a spring welling up to eternal life. In the book of Numbers, we read how in the wilderness there was no water for the Israelites, and how on God's command, Moses struck a rock with his staff, and the water gushed out for the people and their livestock. When we go to God's storehouses, he gives us what we need to help us and not to harm us. And the people of Laodicea, they loved the gifts more than they loved the giver. They were believers, but in their affluent living, their pride made them inattentive. Now, we often hear that the best things in life are free, but what Jesus offers was not free. It was paid for with his sacrifice. For us, it is free in the sense that we can never earn it or buy it. Um, His his grace and his love and his salvation. Um, But in another sense for us, it's not free because we've got to hand over our lives to Christ if we want him to take the wheel. Like the paralytic man that was healed, Jesus needs us to take up our bed and walk. We will receive spiritual healing, forgiveness, and love in abundant measure, but we carry that bed of our faithful sinfulness forward into our new lives as our personal testimony to the saving grace through faith. The cost of a relationship with Jesus for us, with his help to walk in the light, living as he would want to, speaking freely with him frequently, studying the written word to better learn God's ways rather than the ways of people. Don't be afraid to walk to the cadence of his word. When in Revelation, Jesus, through John, says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If we hear his voice, and we open the door to him, he will come in and dine with us. But we've got to be listening for that still small voice. And we've got to be willing, because God is requesting very humbly for permission to enter again into our lives. And as we step out in faith to be God's hands and feet, not only will it bless other people, but it'll bless us. In our faith, 
uh, it'll grow when we walk more closely with Almighty God and his Son, Jesus the Messiah. We will be blessed by love beyond all measure from the one who made us, the one who put the stars in the sky and named them, and the one who is coming back. As it says in the Welsh hymn, Dimagariad, or Here is Love, on the Mount of Crucifixion, fountains opened deep and wide through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers pour incessant from above, and heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty word, world in love. So what things are we holding back from God, which are then in turn getting in the way? Things we know deep down are not what God would want, not how Jesus would live. If you feel that you're a stranger to God, know that you're not a stranger to him. Maybe I've caught your attention. Maybe I've got your curiosity you'd like to know more. Why not simply sit quietly and pray? Talk to God. Tell him you want to know him. Ask him to show you how you can get to know him better. If you're watching this on Facebook or on YouTube, our contact details are in the links on the screen. So thank you whether you're watching or reading or listening. I hope this time has blessed you. Amen. <laughs>